Erev Tov Nes Tziona. Good morning in Northport. Greetings, everyone. My name's Wayne Firestone. Happy to have you here on a beautiful Sunday after a lot of rain in the Northeast. And for many, um, celebrating uh, uh, Sukkot. I want to wish anybody celebrating a uh, Chag Sameach. And thanks for being with us. We've got a great program today with a amazing chef who we've featured previously on our webinar series, but now we're gonna have our own seasonal series uh, with uh, Chef Nir Tzuk, who I'll introduce in a moment and introduce uh, in, in, a, in a beautiful kitchen for you to learn and, and some new recipes, hopefully. But we know we got a group of people here uh, on this beautiful Sunday here uh, that must be very passionate about the pomegranate. Uh, to be here with us, you know it's a magical fruit. You know we can do some magical things with us. But before we, before we hear about the magic um, that, that Chef Nier sprinkles on his dishes, I want to hear from you. Tell us your pomegranate story. What do you know about a pomegranate? Do you know something about it from a recipe, from a book, uh, from the Bible, from any other source that you could share with others on our chat today that makes you at least um, curious, if not passionate, about the pomegranate today? So we want to have you uh, 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 sharing your story, sharing a little bit of, of uh, your own uh, connection to this uh, uh, fruit and its uh, many seedlings and uh, what you are able to do with them. If you got nothing, okay, you can sit back and, and, and watch, but I suspect some mm. people know a little something about the pomegranate. Um, tell us how you would describe its taste. Tell us um, you know, where you have displayed it on, uh, perhaps on a holiday, perhaps in a, uh, uh, a, a fruit drink, um, whatever it is, we're sort of curious to hear about what it is that, that, um, that you use it. I see a guest coming in from the United Kingdom. Um, I don't know if they have pomegranates in the United Kingdom, um, but, uh, they certainly have become very popular and they're certainly very popular in, uh, the Mediterranean. So I'll be watching for, for what you know about the pomegranate as well. But here today to share a little bit uh, about the amazing pomegranate is Chef uh, Nir Tzuk. Uh, look at, just, I mean, just look at that gorgeous uh, 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 kitchen that he's Thank operating you. from, you know, Chef, Chef Nir has uh, uh, been cooking for a long time, um, actually since he was 13. Um, and he's at least 15 now. So that's, you know, at least a few years of, of, of cooking under his belt. Um, uh, he actually moved from the South uh, to the big city of Tel Aviv uh, at 16, started working with great restaurants there, uh, got a, a flair for both the possibilities of uh, the foodie culture of, of Tel Aviv, and then started inventing and creating his own stuff. Uh, he spent time studying and cooking with other chefs in San Francisco and in Paris. And he came back, associated himself with, with uh, numerous different restaurants uh, that you may be familiar with, Al Hamayim, Cordelia, uh, uh, Jaffa Bar. He has served from um, his own table uh, and his own home kitchen here. Uh, you're seeing in Jaffa, and you're going to learn more about that. He is a food columnist for Yidiot Achronot, um, also known as Ynet, to some of you that access it uh, online. He's also well known in Israel on the boob tube, on, on uh, 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 TV, uh, had a, a series, I don't know if it's uh, uh, um, when the last time you did it, but Zucharia, it's also the name of one of his books. He has three cookbooks. Uh, they're all in Hebrew. I did check that beforehand. So uh, for uh, over the course of time, we will pick out some recipes from different ones, show you some pages from it maybe, and uh, learn a little bit more about that. So uh, let's start at the beginning, since we're going to be doing this as a series uh, near when you decided to head into Tel Aviv and, and sort of were experienced as, as a teenager, the possibilities of the kitchen in Tel Aviv, like what, what were you thinking? Were you thinking, you know, this, you have found your, your, 
your calling or, or was it intimidating? What was it like to sort of start Actually, out? Actually, I grew up in a village down south and uh, cooking was always my passion. Cooking and hosting and beautiful dishes and art. So it was a calling. You know, I felt that my time has come and I didn't really like high school, to be honest. I was an okay student, but wasn't really interested. Uh, and I, I felt very passionate about moving forward in my culinary career. So I moved to Tel Aviv and started working in good restaurants. And I'll tell you something funny that you didn't know, that actually I come from a village, from a family of farmers. And one of our main things in the farm is growing pomegranates. Mm. So basically uh, I grew up into pomegranates and I remember my grandmother in the season uh, squeezing the pomegranates and cooking them into grenadine, which many years later I used as a chef in restaurants. But uh, I grew up drinking uh, grenadine with soda water almost every day in summer. So uh, pomegranates with or without are, uh, alcohol. Without alcohol as a kid. Yeah. But I, I don't come from a family of drinkers. I became a drinker many years later. So it took oh, me okay. a while. That, that's all right. You were you were uh, uh, waiting for, for, for the right moment. Right, right exactly. Moment exactly. Um, so w w what would you say when, you know, uh, so take this maybe one step uh, beyond your your origins when you started uh, to get the idea that you wanted to do more of your own thing, let's say. Um, and and how how did you go from restaurant to being sort of um, as entrepreneurial and and uh, at, 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 as you are now so coming back from Paris uh, when I was 21 I was I had a, a, a huge urge to doing my own thing because I had the feeling all the times that you can do amazing things in the kitchen but if your art doesn't show on the other side of the kitchen door uh, people are missing part of the experience of what you do so it was, it was like a dream come true. And uh, the first restaurant, I was very young. I opened up in my own apartment in uh, Jaffa. Uh, it had four tables at the beginning. Then a few months later, it, was, uh, it became very well known. We took the next door building as well. And uh, life uh, turned out that, you know, we had a big operation for, at the peak, we had almost 20 restaurants at the same time operating uh, in order to, at the end, fall down, you know, take all the shells away and come back to cooking at home. Basically, I'm not operating any restaurants at the moment. I'm only consulting to restaurants and big operations. And mainly I host people uh, at my dining room, at my house, up to 30 people. And I do some uh, dinner parties and uh, mainly spiritual things, thank God enjoying life well we we have uh carol just checked in from ramak Gan. um uh there are folks in the center of israel who who you know um on a on a nice afternoon might come out to jaffa for uh the 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 view and the um the the scene can you describe a little bit just before we jump into the kitchen um sort of the, the feel for people. We have done some episodes on Jaffa. It's such a special place. Um, why, why did that become such a good fit for you with, um, uh, particularly now that you're, you're, you're even serving people um, from your home actually, in addition to the Actually, it's funny, you know, the choice of living in Jaffa happened 20 something years ago. I was in Paris and knowing that I'm gonna go back to Israel and I was walking in a boulevard and suddenly I had a vision in my head and I said, okay, if I'm going back to Tel Aviv, I'm going to be in Jaffa because of the architecture, because of the diversity, because of the old port, just a vision that I had. And I came back to Israel and I found my first house in Jaffa. And ever since, I don't know, 25, 27 years later, I'm still in Jaffa. At the moment I lived in the old city, the artist quarter of Jaffa, which is very nice and calm and, you know, close to the port to get fresh fish, close to the caramel market, close to all my favorite spices shops. So it's a nice location to operate from. 
Well, we're excited that you're opening your, your door to uh, uh, guests who come and eat. We're excited that you're opening your kitchen up to our audience of, of food lovers and, and pomegranate uh, 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 potentials. Not, not, uh, <laughs> not everybody has had access to the pomegranate um, like you did when you were uh, on the Kfar and uh, growing uh, your own in the backyard, I guess, in, in, in a sense. Um, and, you know, when we gave you the opportunity to uh, define what we should do for this season as an opening to this series, you immediately went with the pomegranate. So first, tell us about your choice. Why, why are you passionate about the pomegranate? And then we'll, we'll, we'll dive in with a couple of the recipes. You know, it's the flavor, it's the health benefits, it's many things. But now on Tishrei holidays, Pomegranate is something that's almost, we have three Tishrei holidays, right? We have Rosh Hashanah, we have Yom Kippur, and we have Sukkot. And on Rosh Hashanah, we give blessing on the pomegranate, right? And also in Sukkot, we decorate the Sukkah with pomegranate, and we use it uh, to serve in the Sukkah. It's very common to eat sweet and joyful things in Sukkot, because we are obligated, it's a mitzvah to be happy on Sukkot. So at least in my life, if you give me some uh, whipped cream with pomegranate, nothing will make me happy here. So, <laughs> but I'm not going to waste time on a uh, whipped cream and pomegranate for this uh, for this episode. Okay, I'm but I'll teach I'm you some better things. I'm glad you threw that one out there for anyone that 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 you know uh, has trouble following instructions or needs something very quick. You just got you know that was a freebie. That that, that, yeah, that yeah. Uh, we whip some. Whip some cream with sugar and serve it with pomegranate. Okay. So first we're going to start with two very important things. The first one is going to be a cocktail. Very easy one, very joyful. So I have a glass full of ice. And then I'm going to take a pomegranate. Normally what I would do, I would take a juicer. But just in order to show you that even if you don't have a juicer, you can still enjoy a cocktail made of pomegranates. Uh, normally, I would serve it with ouzo or with vodka. Today, I chose vodka. So I'm just squeezing the pomegranate with my hand very easily into the glass on the ice. Half a pomegranate is enough in this case. Now, I just have to tell you something. There are many kinds of pomegranates. Some are very sweet. Some are very sour. Some are tastier. Some are less tasty. So basically, when you want to do a cocktail like this, you should taste the pomegranate because on, in this case, the pomegranate is sweet and sour. But if the pomegranate is only sour, you might want to add some uh, sugar syrup. So basically, super simple cocktail. I have vodka, I have fresh pomegranate juice, a lot of ice. You can add, if you like, a slice of lemon, but you don't have to because it's delicious as it is. So this is the first recipe that we're going to make. I'm going to give a, an example. No need of sugar in terms, in this case. So this is our first recipe. We have a pomegranate cocktail. A lot of people tell me when I give them pomegranate recipes that they don't like putting out the seeds, that it's hard work. So I'm going to teach you how to do it very easily, a way that preserves the seeds. Now there is a a very common thing, at least in Israel, people cut the pomegranate in half and then they turn it over and they knock on it with a spoon. Have you ever seen anyone doing it? So this is a very, very bad system, how to pull out the seeds from the pomegranate. So basically like an orange, I cut off the head of the pomegranate and I make stripes. I open up the pomegranate. I have a bowl full of water and I'm just putting the pomegranate in the water and with my fingers all the seeds are going out into the water very easily i don't know if you know when you peel a, a lot of uh, pomegranates your hands turn to get black so when you do it inside the water it doesn't uh, make the hands black so it's a very good way another thing is we have the yellow cover of the pomegranate. So inside the water, I'll show you, it will rise over the water. So basically I can take out 
all the peels and I have beautiful pomegranate seeds ready to be used. So I made some before so we can move forward to actually a very nice salad recipe. I'm gonna take some red onion and chop it to begin with. I sprouted black lentils before. Do you know how to, to sprout uh, black lentils? I lost you. Something happened here. I'm sorry. No, we're good. You, we hear you. Oh, you hear me? Okay. So I asked, do you know how to sprout black lentils? Uh, no, I, no, I can't say I do. Okay. So maybe it's a good time to learn. Basically, you can buy sprouted black lentils in any good quality supermarket, but it would be very expensive and not always very tasty. And it's something very easy to make at home, especially on uh, black lentils and on mung beans, if you like. So you soak the black lentils in water for 24 hours, uh, just all the time in water. After 24 hours, you strain them and you put a wet cloth on top of it. And for three days, you just mix them once in a while, once a day or twice a day, and you make sure that the cloth up is still wet. And after two or three days, depending on the room temperature, you will have sprouted the lentils, super cheap and super healthy. Now, I'll tell you something very personal for a very, very long time, when the black lentils became, sprouted black lentils or sprouted lentils uh, in any color became trendy, I tasted it in few restaurants, vegan places, and I said, oh, this is not tasty. And for a very long time, I didn't touch it until uh, one day uh, my mom needed to have some black lentils, what we call doctor orders, and I started playing with it. And I realized that when you eat it raw like this, as it used to be served in salads, it's uh, not tasty. It's not fun to eat it like this. It has some aftertaste that stays in your mouth and not very enjoyable. But if you saute the black lent, the sprouted lentils for just you know 30 seconds or even just pour hot water on top of it, you get something completely different that has an amazing taste and crazy health benefits for you. So I took one red onion and I'm sauteing it in olive oil, of course, until it gets lightly brown. I hope the noise uh, of the onion is not bothering anyone. I know that for me, this is uh, the sound of my appetite going, uh, going higher and higher. For, for us, the smell of uh, sauteing onion is the smell of home. So as we do on television, I will cheat a little. Basically, I will allow the onion to saute a little more. This is the part that if you like a garlic, you can add some sliced garlic inside. I don't feel I need it. I'm gonna add the sprouted lentils. And I'm just, for very, very, very short time, I'm gonna allow it to absorb heat to change the flavor. This is super important. You can make the same salad with non-cooked sprouted lentils, but the taste will not be the same. So I've warned you. Basically, that's enough. In here, at the moment, I'm moving into a mixing bowl. But basically, when you normally do it, you can just leave it in the pan and let it cool in the pan and make the whole salad in the pan, just in order not to wash too many dishes at the end. I have a serious allergy to washing dishes. Being in the restaurants for many years, you're always used to having someone washing the dishes for you. But when you cook at home, not always you have someone doing the dishes for you. So I'm trying to be very efficient in my dishes. So for, for those of us who are dishwashers, we, we yes. are very appreciative of that, yeah. that call out. 
Yes, it's super important. Also squeezing the pomegranate with the hand will save you some dishes, but will make the surroundings a bit dirty. So everyone should do their own calculation. So we have an arugula here. Uh, I washed it and dried it, of course. Now, you know, arugula has a very big stem, which normally what you do, you take off the leaves from the stem, but then almost 70% of the arugula you're losing. But if you'll ever taste the stem, you'll see that the stem has the same taste as the leaves and it has something else that the leaves doesn't have. It has crunchiness. So what I do when I, when I pick off the leaves from the stem, I hold the stems in my hand and I don't throw them away because what we're gonna do next might come as a shock for some of you who are used to throwing the stems away. I'm taking, I have the stems already set in my hand and now I'm gonna slice the stems and I'm, I'm adding more arugula into the salad and I'm also getting some crunchiness. So we're adding the chopped arugula and now we're gonna add the pomegranate. Now again, taste the pomegranate because the end of the seasoning has a lot to do with the taste of the pomegranate. How sour, if it's more sour, you'll need less lime. If it's less sour, you'll use more lime. It all depends, you know, it's something you have to feel. I trust you all, you know, to taste it before and you'll see that I'll taste it before I add the, I add the lemon. Chili pepper, you don't have to put chili pepper. I think it's worthwhile. It gives an amazing kick with the sugar of the pomegranate to have some spice in it. Uh, but again, you don't have to. There are many kinds of chili peppers, different types of spiciness. Olive oil, don't need too much. I'm, I'm definitely in favor of those chili peppers. So, uh... yeah. By the way, for those of you who like the chili peppers in Israel, in the States, in the supermarkets, they are called long, hot Italian peppers. It took mm. me a long time to find them in the States because there are many kinds of chili peppers, but the specific kind that we use here is not too spicy, it's not too mellow. Okay, so we have a beautiful salad. Now it's a good time to taste. Mm. So as I said at the beginning, mine is sour and sweet. So I'll use only a little, normally I use lime, today I'll use lemon because the lime wasn't beautiful. And just to show you what it looks at the end, of course the quantities, it's very easy to change on the salad, depends how many people you host. If you wanna take these salads to a friend's sukkah or you know, just for a picnic or whatever, make sure you're starting to make the salad after the lentils are already chilled because otherwise, the arugula and the pomegranate will suffer and it will be not as tasty. I hope it looks nice. It look, it, it, it certainly look, it looks, could you hold it up a little bit just so we can see? You mean for the show off? Yeah, a show off. Well, uh, yeah. That's, oh. I don't see yeah. on the other side, so I'm hoping the show off is, uh, the show off is nice. Uh, are you ready for a dessert? Something sweet, maybe? What, uh, hold, hold on the third one. We have a, a few comments from different people. Let me throw, let me just throw some of that in. Um, uh, first of all, Ruthie pointed out um, that there's um, beautiful orchids in Akko um, at the Baha'i, at the Baha'i uh, gardens that you can see uh, when they're in bloom. So. For those of you uh, that are further north or, or make trips there, be on a special lookout for the groves uh, there. We also heard um, uh, from Ellen, uh, who was pointing out the significance of the 613 seeds. So I guess my question is, have you ever had the opportunity to count them? No, but it's a well-known that it's, a it's called Tariag in Hebrew. 
and uh, every many people who count them say every one of them will have the same number and it's the same number of mitzvahs that we got from God so it's a it's a very famous thing about the pomegranate now Ellen also had a, a, a I don't know if it's a trick or or um, um, something you used as well but to peel them un, peel peel it underwater that's what we did. We yeah. Had, we so, had, we, so when you when, had, when you do that, do you lose any of the the the, the flavor from them, or they're pretty? No, self no, 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 no. You lose nothing. You see, when you when you peel it into the water, you can look into the water. I yeah. peeled it inside the bowl with the water. You see, even the color is not coming out. You need to really break them so something will happen to them. So you don't lose any of the flavor. It's unlike, for example, when you roast, when you grill peppers, if you, after you grill them, you peel them, if you want to wash them in water, you lose the beautiful flavor of the fire. But on pomegranate, it's not the same. So the, the flavor stays and you lose nothing. And smell, we don't have on a pomegranate. So there's not, not an issue. Water is so, great. So the, di the, the dish that you just finished with, um, you had mentioned, um, uh, clearly it's a vegan dish, right? It's, it's, Definitely. Uh, um, and it's a dish that could be served um, uh, with uh, meat or seafood. What, what would you suggest pairing with that kind of a, a salad? Actually, I would go for a feta cheese. I wouldn't mm. go for meat or fish. Uh, feta cheese would be great. Any goat cheese would go with it. Fabulous. Of course, you can serve it, you know, on any meal. If you do a, like a fish dish, it would be beautiful as a side dish. But I wouldn't serve it on, on the same plate because, again, the pomegranate and the arugula doesn't like heat. So you want to serve it on the side so people can take it whenever they like. The pomegranate would break taste beautifully. So if you have a, a, a fish and once in a while you take a bite from the pomegranate and the lentils, you know, you refresh your palate. Um, we, we had um, uh, Edna point out, she's, she grew up in Israel and said uh, her mom used it in lots of different um, uh, types of foods, including baking. Um, have you seen pomegranate? I haven't mm. seen that so much. No, never seen that. I know you can use a pomegranate syrup, okay? Yeah. In baking. By the way, the Persian uh, has a beautiful uh, pomegranate from the sour pomegranates. They do a syrup that they add into meat cookings for casseroles that they uh, cooks for a long time, either from beef or from chicken. They would add a syrup made of pomegranate, a sour syrup, which may, does an amazing job in, uh, in bringing up new and exciting flavors. This is also something, at least in Israel, you can buy in supermarkets. So, uh, so when, you said, when you said earlier, the arugula and the pomegranate don't love heat, that's when served as a salad, but you're saying the exactly. syrup form is a way to flavor potentially meat or poultry or- Yeah, the, 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 the syrup is not a pomegranate anymore. It's a pomegranate that has been cooked for many hours uh, until it, uh, it, it becomes a syrup. So it's like saying you have a silan, which is date honey, and uh, dates. It's not the same thing anymore. So, but I've never seen pomegranate used for baking. But if there is some interesting recipe, I'd love to check it out. <laughs> All right. Our, 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 our first Stump the Chef uh, opportunity. Uh, if you got a great baking recipe uh, with, with pomegranates, uh, 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 Nier is ready to uh, uh, give it a, get, it, it, at least uh, 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 a, a conceptual try. Uh, maybe maybe yes, you can throw something in, 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 the, uh, in the oven at some point. Okay, so we, we are, we're starting with a drink, which is a nice thing to do if you're sitting out in the soca. Um, it's nice to have a cold salad. Uh, you know, it's still still sort of mild and, and not too hard, although in the Mediterranean, maybe a little bit more. Um, so what, what's coming up next? What, do you, what else are you going to show us? Okay, so I'm going to make a dessert that I used to serve in one of, of my restaurants for many years. Very simple. 
a lot of fun. I have one cup of whipping cream in the saucepan. I, to be honest, I heated it before a little to make things faster for us. And while it's about to boil, I have two glasses. I'm gonna fill it up with pomegranate. Into the cream, I'm gonna add some allspice that I grounded freshly. Now, I always recommend people to buy a spice grinder. It's one of the cheapest insurance instruments you can buy to your kitchen. And it's very useful because then you can grind your own spices. Now, especially in peppers, in the pepper you have some acidic oils, essential oils, which when you buy the pepper grounded, you get the spiciness, but not the essential oil. When you grind it freshly, you still have the oils. So this is not black pepper, it's all spice pepper. And I'm adding a little into the cream. Now, all spice has a great perfume in it. And it will always make people think about what they're eating. So you don't have to use it. You can use other peppers or any other spices. You can use cinnamon or cardamom. Okay, you see it's boiling? The cream is boiling. I hope you see it bubbling beautifully. Now I have some white chocolate. So we had one cup of whipping cream, over 200 grams of white chocolate. I'm sure you can translate the grams into more likable uh, measures. And I'm adding the white chocolate into the cream, basically making sort of a ganache. There's my spoon. Of course, the heat is off. Basically, I'm using only the heat that already exists in the cream to melt the white chocolate. Mm. The smell is fabulous of the chocolate and the old spice pepper. In a minute or less, it will be all smooth. You can use a whisk. It will be easier and faster. And then what we used to do in the restaurants and what I recommend to do also at home is bring the hot sauce into the table, not pour it over the pomegranate. Now you can make the hot sauce in advance and just heat it a little, but it's much easier and better to do it fresh. It takes, as you've seen, just as long as it takes uh, for the cream to boil. Almost smooth and smelly. And then whenever we are ready to serve the dessert, either with a spoon or just on top of the pomegranate, I hope you see it. Some hot white chocolate sauce with the pomegranate. Now, you remember that earlier I told you that pomegranate doesn't like it, right? But when you eat it fresh, uh, the cold pomegranate with the hot white chocolate sauce, it's a different ball game. I hope you see how beautiful it is and how elegant. Now that I'm is give, beautiful. I'm going to give a presentation of what are you supposed to do with it. Mm. I'm happy. Super important to do the combination at the last minute. Otherwise, if it sits in the white chocolate, the white chocolate will congeal with the cream and uh, the pomegranate will become hot and we lose the, uh, you know, all the happiness and, you know, crunchiness. So eat it while it's hot. All right, let's, let's go back to the top because uh, we have questions and comments now on, on all three dishes. So let's now start I'm with relax. the two. You, you, you can relax, but we're, we're all, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to decide which one, you know, we could make the quickest. Okay. Um, I don't know, I, if I, and I can't wait three days for my lentils. So uh, uh, you're much more patient than I am. <laughs> Uh, so let's start with the, uh, uh, the, the using 
the juice for the drink. Edna pointed mm -hmm. out, and and anyone that spent time, um, you know, with street food in Israel knows at, at certain times of the year you can get someone with a crank to make you fresh pomegranate juice on the spot with nothing else in it but but 100% pomegranate. In it. What do you sure. think about that? That's great. Now you just need to come with a glass of ice and a bottle of vodka. That's it. But also many places would sell you freshly squeezed pomegranate juice. So this would be great for the cocktail, but at least for hosting people, it's really nice to squeeze the fresh pomegranate in front of your guests. You know, it gives a conversation. It shows freshness. It shows that you love them. So I don't know. Right, you well, can buy fresh right, pomegranate. Well, and you can squeeze. We definitely have have uh, pomegranate lovers on this call. I'll, I'll call out one, uh, uh, Sandy from Plainville. Um, our friend Sandy uh, has counted the seeds, or at least has compared. And he said, if you go with bigger pomegranates, you're going to get more seeds. If you go with smaller pomegranates, you're going to get fewer seeds. So, uh, uh, so the the Torah says something different. I don't know. <laughs> I never counted. All right. So far, we we haven't had too many uh, uh, tour debates on on uh, uh, on the episodes, but uh, we do encourage everyone that wants to to try uh, uh, to make sure uh, you you um, try both. Right? Try a small one and um, try a larger one. And uh, if you have time, you know, uh, count the mitzvahs, uh, count the the good uh, good deeds with with each one. So. Um, uh, a, a, a question about substitution, because um, you're, 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 you know, that bottle of vodka is staring us and you. Uh, it's actually the only thing between us and you is that bottle of vodka. Uh, someone wants to know if you can use gin instead of vodka. Yeah, Uzo, Arak, or Anis drinks would be great. Gin would be great as well. Great. Okay. So whatever you got, you know, in, in, in the storage room or behind the bar, wherever it is. Uh, can... Whatever, basically whatever is transparent. So I, I wouldn't do it with any of the brown guys, the whiskey uh, or the okay. rum, or, but all the transparent ones would, would, do, would do the job. All right, so the only uh, um, nomination I have for, it's not really baking, uh, but uh, uh, pomegranates and pancakes. What do you think about that idea? Would the, would, how would the French perceive that? Okay, so pomegranate and pancakes, not inside the pancake. So blueberries and raspberries you can put inside the pancake uh, dough, which is great. Pomegranate won't work, but uh, if you want to do a pile of, of uh, pancakes with some creme pâtissière or whipped cream or chocolate sauce, you can put on top fresh pomegranate would do great, but not inside the baking of the pancake. Uh, other things that, by the way, about the dessert, you can switch the pomegranate into fresh uh, raspberries, which would do maybe even better than pomegranates. Less for Israel, but yeah. Okay. Can you use citru a, a citrus juicer to squeeze the pomegranates? or it Definitely. What's that? Definitely. You can use the juicer. The best ones are the ones that put a lot of pressure from the top side, but any juicer would do the trick. Sometimes the pomegranate are very big, so the juicer would be a little too small for them. So you might even need to cut the pomegranate into four in order to use the juicer. Yeah, sure. Okay, so there, there, there are some tricks, it, it, at least in terms of uh, the preparation. On, yes. uh, on, on the drink and the juice alone or with clear liquid um, alcohol, not, not the darker ones. And uh, why don't you, you know, I mean, while you're sitting there, if you're in a sukkah or you're just sitting outside on your scoop or, or uh, 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 having friends over for, uh, you know, um, for a nice evening together, maybe trying pomegranate with them with one of those um, alcohol mixes, it's, it, it, it seems like a pretty easy recipe and uh, you might get a lot of uh, kudos for trying something new. Uh, um, Definitely a nice way to spend the evening. Somebody pointed out that there's a, a brand, at least in, in uh, I think in, in the United States called Palm, 
um, which is uh, available in supermarkets with pomegranate juice. So if you don't have fresh pomegranates nearby, um, and uh, you know it, that that shouldn't stop you from from uh, finding them. And these days, you can pretty much find a lot of uh, uh, more exotic and and other other fruits uh, from the Mediterranean and, and other parts of the world, uh, if you look hard enough. Um, okay. By, by the way, look. California is a huge grower of pomegranates. And at least uh, for my traveling in the States for cooking in, in many places, normally it was very possible to get fresh pomegranates. So well, so that's my we experience. Def we definitely have several people on today, San Francisco, San Diego, um, and other parts of California. So, uh, we hope that you'll get some fresh ones on behalf of all the rest of us. Um, let's move from the drink uh, back to the, the salad questions. Uh, several questions about the lentils. First of all, um, you used black lentils. Tell us why and whether any of the other colored lentils might work with this recipe or, or if there's, you know, you know, they have, they, because of texture, because of their, their okay, so otherwise. black black lentils are the easiest to sprout, and they have the best texture. So whenever I want to do sprouting, I will always almost do it with black lentils. They are the easiest to sprout, and uh, they have the best taste. But anything sprouted would work for that recipe. Uh, I try to sprout many kinds of lentils. I had. The, the best results with the black ones and the mung beans. So yeah, you can do it with anything. If you want to go the easiest, at least in sprouting, sprout the black ones. If you want to make the salad from a, a sprouted the lentils that you buy, sometimes you get a mix. So you can use the mix because those are well sprouted and we do a good job. A bit expensive, but no labor. Just one thing, uh, in favor of sprouting your own. When you sprout lentils, after they are sprouted, you can put them in the fridge. They will be okay for up to a month. So wow. when, you, when you do it, you always have something available. You, then you can saute them with some garlic and chicken or garlic and a, a fish or make a salad, whatever you feel like. So it's worthwhile making the effort sprouting. Well, you have at least at least two people of uh, uh, both uh, Sarah and Susan have asked you to explain again how you sprout the the black lentils. Uh, so there With are pleasure. Some, we do have people in the audience that are more patient than I am. So I soak the black lentils in water for twenty four hours, just big bowl of water with the lentils. Make sure they drink a lot of water at the beginning. Then it stays in the water. Then I strain it very well. It has to stay damp, not very dry. I put it in a bowl and I cover it with a wet cloth. It needs to be in the dark. Then uh, it's a wet surrounding, dark with a wet cloth on top. And about once or twice a day, I mix the lentils, make sure it's still damp and uh, covering it with wet cloth. And basically between two to four days, depends on the temperature where you live, uh, they will sprout beautifully. And then you just keep them in the fridge covered with some, I don't know, paper or a dry towel, and it stays up to a month. Wow. Um, sounds easy, huh? It sounds, uh, if you're patient, I guess it sounds yeah. easy. If, if, if yeah. you're not, if you, if you need your lentils now, then it's a little more. more uh, yeah, it's all very possible. You know, the, the nice thing about it is that, yeah, it takes a few days, but basically, the labor is nothing, you know, you don't need to spend any time on it. Yep. Nothing gets dirty. So yeah, it takes time. But then for a month, you know, you have something with very high quality, very healthy in your fridge. So I recommend. You know, one of the probably food trends, I guess, that that is uh, um, uh, becoming larger um, uh, globally is, is this whole idea of farm to table um, and growing up on a farm and being near the markets that you're near, uh, that, that uh, uh, gives you a unique, and many Israeli uh, chefs sort of, uh, I think, a heads up in this uh, particular trend. What, what are you seeing 
uh, both among Israelis, Israeli diners, um, uh, do they see these foods as um, and uh, the dishes that that you make as um, being something that feel authentically local in a sense, but also given your world travels, your other influences, do they feel like, oh, that's a very U European style of of cuisine or or some kind of uh, fusion? I think it's uh, it's very local, and you know. Israelis travel a lot, and uh, fresh ingredients is something very basic in me. We all grew up in homes that food was cooked daily fresh. So only now it's changing a bit, but basically this is uh, the, the heart of Israeli living is the fresh, the, the fresh eating. So I think people are appreciative for something fresh and delicious. And I think for me, the traveling, the knowledge, all the different kinds of restaurants and things I've done around the world, what it's good is give you, it gives you a great background and a lot of knowledge for many other things. So you can improvise in your local cuisine. So you can take a Chinese technique and use it for Mediterranean food. The guest eventually, he doesn't know that you used a Chinese technique because the flavors and the tastes and what you're doing is at the end Mediterranean. Mediterranean. So it's very important to have a, a big background and a lot of knowledge in what you do because it allows you to get into a higher level of uh, accuracy. Um, so we had a question from Judy. Do you have to saute the store-bought sprout, uh, sprouts um, in the same way that you would the self-sprouted? Um, which if you make them sprouts, I'm sorry. If you if, sprout if you yourself, buy them, um, if you buy them already ah, made, you okay. still need to saute them. You don't have to saute them or cook them, but the flavor will be much better. So even 20 seconds in olive oil, or even just pour hot water on top of it from the kettle and let it stay, let it stay for you know a minute, the flavor will be better because in the raw taste there is something not pleasant. So no, you don't have to do it. It considered to be more healthy if you eat it raw, but it's just not tasty. This is for my taste. So we we wanted to clarify for for one of our our, our viewers is asking after you chew the pom pomegranates, do you spit out the seed? I guess any extract, no, or is it safe no. to swallow it? Of course, you no, you swallow it. Yep. When do you want? Okay, if you bought pomegranate and you feel like you want to spit the seeds. It means that this pomegranate was not ripe. Mm. Basically, when the pomegranate is ripe, it's very easy. You eat it with the seed and, of course, health, no issue. But on the contrary, uh, there is now a, a medicine done from the brain made only from the seed of the pomegranate. So uh, po if you Google pomegranate seed oil, you'll find some very interesting things in terms of health. Um, a question about how to tell if a pomegranate is ripe. Any, any tricks on that or? I'm sorry. You have to trust your vendor. I know that's a, that's unpopular answer, but uh, that's the only one I have. Because basically when you look at the pomegranate, there are so many kinds. You don't know which kind it is, many new kinds. Each one of them has a season, a specific time. I have no idea. But I know that if you have a good uh, vegetable shop, he won't sell you a non-ripe pomegranate. Now, if you have a non-ripe pomegranate, unlike mango, for example, mango, you buy it sometimes unripe, you put it in a bowl, uh, and it will become ripe. So pomegranate, if it was picked not in the right time, it will not become ripe. Well, we, we have a comment from uh, Jean Mary in San Antonio, Texas, saying uh, both pomegranates and figs are something, are childhood memories from uh, mm. uh, growing up in Texas. So we, California and Texas, at least, uh, we know if anybody else has pomegranates in their backyard or, or uh, where they live, let us know that as well. Uh, we're happy to pass it on. 
There was a comment earlier I wanted to reference from Myrna uh, saying that Florida cheers the people of the pomegranate. So uh, 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 thanks for the branding opportunity hmm. uh, around our, our foodie exercise uh, uh, today. Uh, obviously a, a great deal of love uh, for the pomegranate. I'll do one more on the main dish before we get to the dessert. Um, the question is, um, could you pair chicken with pomegranate? I know you mentioned the pomegranate syrup, but and any thoughts on chicken breast or, or chicken? Um... So for a chicken salad, pomegranate would do great because it has both the acidity and the color and the juice. So what I would do, I would saute the chicken, chicken breast, and I would let it chill. And when it's chilled, I would uh, slice it into slices and then add it some uh, to romaine and some maybe Caesar sauce and some fresh pomegranate on top. Sounds like a good deal for me. Maybe some fresh cilantro as well. <laughs> but not Somebody. for a hot, not for a hot chicken. For a okay, hot chicken, that, if I, you I want that, 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 that may have been the, the question. Then that, that's a good clarification. Okay, that, so the, for the, for a hot chicken. What I would do, I would do like a casserole with the pomegranate syrup we discussed before. Now, I assume for some people, it would be difficult to find the pomegranate syrup. By the way, you can get it in a Persian or Syrian groceries for those of you who have around. What you can do as a twist, you can buy grenadine, you know, the thing you use for the cocktail for Shirley Temple or... Uh, to add a little to champagne or white wine to give it a little flavor. Grenadine is also made of pomegranate and then you can do a casserole and add a zip of grenadine inside. It will give you some beautiful red color and some sugar. So moving to the dessert for a moment, uh, we have one question about whether you could, your, your thoughts on switching out a uh, dark chocolate for white chocolate. I know it would change that beautiful color you have there. <laughs> you can. The quantities would be the same, by the way. It would, be it would still be one cup of uh, whipping cream on 200 grams of chocolate. Uh, I like it less. I don't like the combination between the dark chocolate and the sour fruits. I know some people love it. Personal mm -hmm. taste of mine, I like it less. Uh, I would happily change the pomegranate into a raspberry, blueberry, blackberry, any kind of berry. Uh, moving into dark chocolate, if you want, go for it. You know, not when I'm guesting your suka. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. Um, we have a shout out from Arizona that Arizona grows the pomegranate tree as well. Um, looking at the dessert cup in front of you. Can you describe it? what what's the consistency like? It is is it a uh, very like, thick. It is thick. Yeah, so it's like yeah, a pudding. Yeah. It's it's more like a chocolate ganache. Mm -hmm. Think of a oh. heavy heavy hot chocolate sauce, right? So this is the consist consistency. Sorry for my English, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. That's perfect. Um, you know, you make um, a, a reference to, you know, um, uh, serving something in your sukkah. Could you maybe give a little bit of a feel uh, in, in Jaffa and other, you know, parts of Israel? Not everyone who has visited Israel has visited Israel during the holiday of Sukkot. And um, could you just share a little bit about the Israeliness of the holiday and, and how that is experienced by people, uh, particularly uh, with, with hospitality and serving meals outside in the sukkah? Actually, it's a very special holiday. It's a really holiday that's about happiness. And, uh, you know, people are on vacation and it's a, it's a very busy holiday because, you know, it's a, it's a custom to host people in your sukkah. So basically people are moving around all the time there are a lot of activities. Now, normally in Jewish holidays, a big part of the population in Israel doesn't drive because they keep Shabbat and holidays. They will not go around. But Sukkot is also special because there is one day of holiday 
and then you have almost seven days that uh, you don't work and it's a holiday, but you're allowed to drive and you're allowed to do anything. So the, the country is super busy. Things are happening. Now, as well, you know, it's one of the three times to go to Jerusalem. So it's all very hectic. Uh, there is a very good ambience, at least in Tel Aviv. When you go into the countryside, you see many Sukkot all around. In Tel Aviv, the city makes a lot of Sukkot around the city. Because even if you just, by the way, you know, we think of mitzvah as something that's annoying, right? You have to do something. But it's the only holiday that enough that you go inside, just stepping inside, once you stepped inside the sukkah, you already did the mitzvah. So there are many around the city. And basically, if you just go inside and drink water, you can be happy about yourself. Well, I, lo I love the idea of a happy, happy holiday. And certainly to start the new year and to be able to be outside um, hosting people, enjoying uh, fresh fruits and recipes is, is, is definitely adds to it. Um, we are, uh, I wanna assure everyone on, on the episode today, if you want the recipes, um, just send us uh, an email to AIFL.org, uh, webinar at AIFL.org, and we're happy to send the recipes to you. Um, they're uh, things then you can play with, and, and it's, it, it's part of um, this series that we're doing now um, uh, with Chef uh, Zook, that you'll get to experience different dishes in different seasons uh, that uh, as we move through uh, the year. Um, and anything, Chef Zook, you want to, we're, we're coming up on the top of the hour, anything else that you want to add about, um, you know, uh, sukkah uh, uh, cooking and, and uh, uh, cuisine for, for the fall uh, before we, we close out? You know, at least in here, this is a beautiful season because times are changing, everything becomes greener, uh, guava is coming on season, citrus fruits are becoming beautiful now, all the greens uh, are becoming fresher and more alive. It's a good time to think about fresh food this season. It's still a bit hot, you want to eat light. When you host outside, you want to think that you can make in advance and just serve nicely and enjoy time with friends. So think about how you enjoy your time with the people and not how hard you walk in the kitchen. Beautiful, beautiful message for, for the, the holiday and, and quite inspiring to start our series together. We're very much looking forward to um, uh, counting the seasons with you and counting the different mm. ways that we can uh, 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 all share with each other from the culinary arts and just thinking about you there and the fresh markets and the artists and the galleries that are surrounding you itself is sort of uh, brings happiness to me, I, I, I'm sure to uh, many others from all the, the uh, um, accolades and, and thank yous that we're receiving uh, from people who have been on the call and, and wishing you and your family a, 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 a Sukkot Sameach. Uh, Sukkot Sameach, and uh, uh, we're very much looking forward to. We hope for everyone that you'll be back with us. Um, uh, we're going to take a couple of, uh, of our regular scheduled days off during this high holiday period, but we are back on October 15th, which is a Sunday, um, where we have a program on Gold of My Ear, uh, about uh, with, uh, frankly, at the same time that many of you may know that there is a major uh, movie out in the theaters starring uh, Helen Mirren about Golda, um, sort of historical uh, fiction account of, of her life. Well, believe it or not, in Denver, there's an entire museum dedicated uh, to Golda and the period of time that she lived there. We have experts that include her, her, her uh, biographer and someone who worked with her knew or uh, whose mother knew her way back in, in, in uh, the old country uh, in the Midwest of the United States. So we hope you'll come back and join us for that uh, special. It's, it's a replay of the episode, but we'll update you on, um, you know, if you didn't see it, we hope, we hope you'll, uh, we're already getting uh, great comments uh, about the, the, the Golden Golden movie. So if you want some more context, if you want really to, to talk with people who knew her uh, personally, please come join us 
Sunday the 15th for our next episode. And uh, we've already you know, uh, shared on many different episodes that our big gala at AIFL is just around the corner. Um, it also will take place on the same day as our Israel Day at the New York Stock Exchange. And we will be having special uh, programming around that as well separately that we'll tell you about. But please, November 27th, Pierre Hotel in New York, earlier in the day, New York Stock Exchange, Israel Day, two powerful um, uh, programs that you can experience uh, in person if you're going to be in New York. Shoot us a note, let us know, we can let you know more about it. So for now, um, I'm going to sign off for, for, uh, uh, for a few weeks, but we'll be back uh, with you for our Golda episode. Looking very much looking forward to that. For those of you celebrating the holidays, Hag Sameach, Modim Lesimcha, happy, healthy new year to everyone.